for some of you joining today, this is a continuation of the talk I began on Friday. And the title of the talk, the subject of the talk is Election, Free Will, and Eternal Security. And um, I won't repeat the justification or, or why, why I was, believe it's an important subject to talk about or to be clear on. And we're just going to jump right in because these are recorded. I guess you could go back and listen to the first half if you're curious. But I didn't, I intended to get all the way through in the first meeting and then talk about eternal security today. But there was something that I didn't get to cover as usual. I tend to talk, uh, bring in too many things and the talk goes too long. But there was a verse that I read it's at the end of Romans 11, Romans 11, 32. And in J&D's translation, it, it reads, God has shut up together all, that is Jew and Gentile, in unbelief in order that he might show mercy to all. And uh, I just want to touch on this thought of show mercy to all. Because there are confusing thoughts out there in Christendom. Uh, there's a something called limited atonement and so on. And let's be very clear uh, that God's offer of salvation is unto all. No question about it. It is limited in its application to those that receive it, to those that believe. But his offer of salvation is not in any way limited. There are two thoughts in scripture, and they uh, go under the name of uh, propitiation and substitution. We'll touch on that a little bit. And then the other is purchase and redemption. We'll touch on those two things briefly. I don't want to actually talk on this subject too much. I just want to clear up some thoughts in case there's any confusion. So just, uh, I'm going to read another verse, Romans 3.22. It says, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all. Again, it's unto all, unlimited. But then it goes on to say, and upon all them that believe. There's a verse in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 6. It says, Christ Jesus gave himself a ransom for all, not for some, but for all. But that verse is an interesting one because there's a parallel verse in Matthew's gospel which appears to contradict it. Because in Matthew's gospel, it says, the Son of Man came to give his life a ransom for many and does not say all. That's Matthew 20, verse 28. But this is where translations and languages come into the mix, because in the original, in those two verses, one in Timothy and one in Matthew, there's a different Greek word used in each instance. And no matter how I translate it into English, <laughs> it's a difficult uh, thought to explain. But let me just say that in Matthew, the word used implies in the place of many in the place of many. In uh, Timothy, it's more for the thought of on the behalf of all. And this really brings out the two thoughts of propitiation and substitution. Propitiation addresses itself to the condition of things generally in the world. Substitution, on the other hand, is limited to those who receive it. So there are verses that speak of substitution, Romans 4.25. Substitution, by the way, just simply means the Lord Jesus taking my place. He is my substitute. So Romans 4.25 says, Jesus, our Lord, who was delivered for our offenses. First Peter 2.24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. These verses can only be said of a believer. Christ was indeed my substitute. And if you're a believer, he was your substitute. He bore the penalty of your sins in your place. You cannot preach to the unconverted that Christ bore their sins. Often 
we do. Uh, we use very loose language perhaps when we preach the gospel, but technically we cannot say to an unconverted soul that Christ has borne their sins in his own body on the tree, like it says in First Peter. So again, substitution is limited to those who receive it. Propitiation is Godward. Substitution, on the other hand, deals with individuals, you and me. And so in 1 John 2.22, it can say that the Lord Jesus is propitiation for our sins, but not for our sins only, but also for the whole world. And it's the same thought that we have in John's Gospel, chapter 1, when John um, the Baptist looked on the Lord Jesus and he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. That is who he was characteristically, the taker away of the sin of the world, and that is what he was to God. He has indeed addressed the question of sin in this world completely and utterly to God's satisfaction, and more than that, to his glory. So again, propitiation addresses itself Godward. It is concerned with this world. Substitution is more manward and is concerned with individuals. Propitiation is an atonement that's unlimited in, va in value and availability. It's only limited by our unbelief, but God, because of propitiation, can extend mercy to all, goes out to all, whether or not you receive it, whether or not an individual can say that the Lord Jesus is born in his body, their sins, that depends on whether they are saved or not. And as I said, this is a subject I don't really want to digress too far into. But there's a similar thought in connection with purchase and redemption. Purchase is a simple concept. You go out and buy something, and they're yours. I could, um, well, uh, I'll use an all-time example. I hate to use it because it brings in a, uh, it brings in a, the subject of slavery. But I could, in, in days gone by, an individual could purchase a slave. And that individual was owned by the one that was purchased, uh, by the purchaser. But that same individual could purchase that slave and then turn around and set them free. Two very different situations. And if you or I were in the position of that slave, I know which one I would want to be. I would want to be the one that was purchased and set free. Being purchased and set free, that's redemption. That's what redemption does for us. It, uh, we have been purchased and set free. But there are, and, and, and when you look at the word purchase in scripture, you've got to look at it in context, because sometimes it can be limited to believers, but other times it's universal in its character. So for example, in a Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 1 it says denying the lord that bought them so here it's speaking of people that's denying the lord these aren't believers they're denying the lord but it still says he bought them he paid that price of course there are plenty of verses we could read in connection with redemption and in each case it's restricted to the believer so for example ephesians 1 7 in whom we have redemption through his blood at the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. An illustration of the difference between purchase and redemption is in the parable in Matthew 13 of the field with the treasure in it. So Christ has purchased the field. And we know from the parables that precede it, the field is the world. He has purchased the world. He has paid that price. But within that field, there was a treasure. So again, just to, to just to wrap up these few brief thoughts on these subjects that no doubt could an entire meeting could be addressed to. If we confuse propitiation substitution, if we confuse purchase and redemption, then we either fall into the trap of universalism, which says that everyone is ultimately going to be saved because God has purchased everyone, 
Uh, his propitiation is for the whole world, so therefore all are ultimately going to be saved. But there are not too many, too difficult to find verses that would make that a very hard case to press. But nevertheless, there are those that insist that is the, that is the situation. But then the other, uh, the other problem that we can fall into, and it's more in connection with our subject of election and propitiation, uh, election and predestination, and that is, is that God's offer of salvation is limited in some way. It's not limited. It is unto all. Okay, I'm going to switch gears a little bit, as we say in English. And I want to talk about the last subject. So we talked about election last meeting, and we talked about free will in the last meeting last meeting. And now I want to talk about the, the third subject in the title of this talk, and that is eternal security. And it's connected. It's connected to the other two subjects. Well, what do we mean by eternal security? Well, we simply mean that one is truly one that who, who is truly saved through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ can never lose their salvation. That's what we mean when we talk about the eternal security of the believer. The expression itself is not found in scripture, but it is clearly taught. And I trust I will show that uh, this morning, it's morning for me, afternoon for you, evening. But you know, at the root of the, the struggles that people have with this, and many people struggle with this. In fact, there's theological systems or teachings out there that will insist that you can lose your salvation. If you don't walk godly, you can lose your salvation. But at the root of all such struggles, all such difficulties, all such confusion is a failure to understand the nature of salvation. If I have been chosen in Christ from before the foundation of the world, and I'm predestined to be holy and without blame before him in love, a child by Jesus, of Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, then clearly my salvation rests secure. But if I am the one that was responsible for my salvation, if I indeed had free will, and last meeting we showed that we do not have free will, not at least in the theological sense of it. If I am responsible for my salvation, then clearly I can be responsible for losing it. But I'm not responsible for my salvation. That's the point. Ultimately, we have to admit that we had nothing, nothing whatsoever to do with our salvation. You know, eternal, uh, I'll talk a little bit about eternal life. Eternal life is especially the subject of the Apostle John. So John in his gospel, he shows that life in the life of the Lord Jesus. And then in his first epistle, we have it in the life of the believer. But he begins his first epistle with talking about the one that they had seen, the one that they had handled, the one they had heard and so on, that life that was manifest to them. That's the gospel of John. It was that eternal life manifest to them. But we read in John's gospel that he that believes in the son has life eternal. That's uh, the new translation, J and D's translation. In John's epistle, chapter five, First Epistle, chapter 5, verse 13, it says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. The believer has eternal life. It's the very life of the believer here and now. It's not something we wait for. You know, for so many centuries in Christendom, there was this notion that we would live very good lives here and when we got to the gates of heaven, there would be a judgment and we would there would decision be made that whether we'd get in or we would be cast into hell. That has been a, a general thought, believe it or not, for centuries in Christendom. It is completely and utterly wrong. We do not wait to know whether we're saved. We do not wait to come into, uh, to, to receive eternal life. Scripture is very clear. We, if you believe, 
and you're saved, you possess eternal life. Now, usually when we talk about eternal life, we emphasize the quality of that life because eternal life is more than just about the length of the life that we possess in Christ. It talks about the quality or character of that life because it brings into the, us into the knowledge of the Father. But today I want to emphasize the length of that life. How long is eternal life? Eternal life is eternal. So when people talk about losing their salvation, they don't understand that they have this life. And if they understand that they have this life, then it's not eternal. It doesn't get much simpler than that. If you have eternal life, then you have eternal life. And it's not something that is shorter than eternal. You know, and getting back to what we said about um, the previous subject, the previous meeting, uh, John 17, verse 2 says, The Father hath given him, that is the Son, power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life as to many as thou hast given him. So God acts according to his sovereignty. He gives life to whomsoever he will. That work of salvation is his alone. It rests with him. It is secure. And it is eternal. Nothing shorter than that. John uh, chapter 10 says, I give unto them eternal life. Same thought again. And they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. And in the Greek, there's a double negative there. And in English, a double negative negates the negative. It's a peculiarity of English. But in Greek, um, the thought is they shall no, never perish. So in case there's any doubt, there's this strength, strengthened negative used there. But of course, the answer will be, well, no one can remove me out of God's hand, but I can remove me out of God's hand. And as I said, anyone that thinks that does not really understand the true character of salvation. They see their salvation resting upon a work, at least some small effort on their part. And usually those same people view salvation as a, a, uh, a restoration of the human spirit. God is fixing us. We're broken and God has to fix us. And it's a work in progress. And so if it's a work in progress, then it can regress. It can be undone. You know, if I ask the question, but, but just to uh, emphasize actually something I said in a previous talk so when I talked about the old and new nature, if we've been born anew, then we have a completely new life in Christ. The old nature, as far as God is concerned, is crucified with Christ. Done with. End of story. You know, if I ask that question, if I make that statement, well, I can remove myself out of God's hand, who is the I that is saying that? It's not the new nature. The new nature would never say something like that. It is the old nature. But the old nature is done with. It's in God's sight crucified. If we possess that new life, we've been born anew. To lose it would require us to be unborn. It's nonsense, completely nonsensical. We cannot be unborn again. You know, whenever the subject of eternal security comes up, the epistle to the Hebrews comes into the picture. And so I'm gonna spend some time talking about the two objections that are raised from the epistle to the Hebrews. The first one is in chapter six, and the second one is in chapter 10. But the epistle to the Hebrews is a unique epistle. The Lord Jesus himself is uniquely the author of the epistle. We don't know who physically wrote it. Um, I personally believe it was the apostle Paul, and there is evidence towards that. Many today, these days, for whatever reason, don't go along with that. But it sort of misses the point to try to figure out who wrote it because the Lord Jesus himself is peculiarly uh, 
the apostle of it. And you can see that in the beginning of the third chapter of Hebrews. It says, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Jesus. So Jesus himself is peculiarly the author of the epistle. You know, there were many Jews, and, th and who's it written to? Well, it's called the Hebrews. There were many Jews who had identified with the Lord in his walk down here. They had recognized that he was the Messiah, or at least outwardly owned that he was the Messiah. But then something happened, and these there are two huge hurdles for the Jew. Number one, the Messiah died. Now, they should have known that from their Old Testament scriptures. But for many Jews, that was a huge stumbling block. They did not look for a Messiah that was going to die. They looked for a Messiah that was going to come and deliver them out of their bondage. And that brings up the second objection, the second stumbling block for the Jew. And that is those Jews that identified with Christianity were being persecuted. And that seemed completely backwards to them. They look for a Messiah that was going to deliver them, and he dies. Yes, he rose again, and he ascended up to glory. But then they were left behind to suffer persecution. Let's be clear, the book of Hebrews addresses uh, reality. It assumes reality. It assumes reality in those to whom it's talking to, that they were true believers. But there are hints throughout the book, throughout the epistle, that suggests that there was some doubt in the mind of the author that there were those that identified with Christianity, identified with the Lord Jesus, having received him as their, his, uh, having received him as their Messiah, but they might not be real. They might not be saved. So, for example, in uh, Hebrews 4.11, it says, let us therefore use diligence to enter into the rest that no one may fall, on, uh, fall after the same example of not hearkening to the word. So Hebrews 3 and 4, it brings out the journey of the children of Israel from the land of Egypt into the land of Canaan. And we know that they all set out, but they didn't all arrive. And why didn't they arrive? Well, it tells us in Hebrews 3, verse 18 and 19, to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. It was unbelief that caused those that didn't enter the land of Canaan to enter in. And it would be unbelief now on behalf of those Jews that had received the Lord Jesus Christ as a messiah at least outwardly it would be unbelief that would prevent them from ultimately entering into the rest of god unless they uh uh pushed uh, uh, uh how, how shall i put it pressed on didn't give up didn't turn back but uh received the lord jesus christ as their savior you know this this uh Unbelief on the behalf of, behalf of man is really man's great sin. And that is uh, calling into question God's goodness. Eve, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, they called into question God's goodness. Man continues to question the grace of God and it's his undoing. We'll get to that in a little bit. It also says in Hebrews 4, 2, that those that didn't enter the land of Canaan, didn't do so because it says, uh, um, well, uh, uh, so all Israel took that first step in leaving Egypt, but for many, there was no faith. So a whole nation left Egypt, but there was only a subset of them that actually had faith. So it says in Hebrews 4, 2, not being mixed with faith in them that heard. So likewise, there were perhaps those that were identified with the Jewish Christians that had received the Lord Jesus outwardly as Messiah, but it was not mixed with faith. There was not faith there. You know, Hebrews 5, so, so the, the, the book of Hebrews is a very logically laid out book. 
and Hebrews 3 and 4 in particular take up the wilderness journey. And then it talks about the priesthood. And then the writer introduces the Melchizedek priesthood. And then he stops. And he says, you know, you're like little babes. You, you can't take meat. You're only ready for milk. And then chapter 6 comes in. And it's a parenthesis. And then in chapter seven, he resumes the subject of the Melchizedek priesthood of Christ. So keep that in mind. Chapter six is a parenthesis, and it's an interruption in the thought because the writer is concerned that there were those that were still babes and not ready for strong meat. And so Hebrews six begins with a very odd statement begins with, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let's go on unto perfection. I'm going to read it a little differently. I'm going to read it, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Messiah, let us go on unto full growth. So the difficulty with the first statement is, is why would this author be telling people to leave the doctrines of Christ? Well, put yourself in the Jewish position. He's telling them, you need to leave the basic principles, the basic teachings concerning the Messiah. And you need to go on to that now, which produces full growth. The basic things that the, the, the Jews looked for in the Messiah was someone to come redeem Israel someone to free them from their bondage. But there was so much more that they overlooked. And now, of course, we get to the New Testament and there is so much more that they were not familiar with. And that they're exhorted here to go on to that which uh, corresponds to full growth in Christianity, not now Judaism, but full growth in Christianity. They had to advance beyond their earthly hopes that rested upon a very earthly Messiah. And the next, uh, uh, it also sends it and says at the end of that first verse, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of the laying on of hands. Well, why would he say not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works? And why would he speak here of doctrine of baptisms? I thought baptism was something connected with Christianity. Well, two points as to that. One, the word used here actually is not referring to the ordinance of baptism, but is referring to washings. And in the Jewish religion, there was a lot of washings that went on, literal washings of water. We know also that baptism was something that was practiced. When John the Baptist came, there were those that listened to his message and the promise of the one that he that would come after him. And they recognized that the nation was under the governmental hand of God. And they submitted to what was called the baptism of repentance in connection with John the Baptist. Well, let's suppose one that had submitted to that baptism of John, had looked forward to the coming of the Messiah, had repented, recognizing God's government upon that nation. But what now they suddenly decide, well, Jesus really wasn't the Messiah. He died. He, he didn't deliver Israel. Well, that left, that would leave that individual in a terrible position. They repented for nothing, as it were. The one that John was the forerunner of, they refused. They're, they're in a, <laughs> they're completely lost, without hope. Having rejected the one and only Messiah that would come, that came in answer to the Old Testament prophets, if they had submitted to the baptism of John, if they turned around now and said, well, all that was for nothing, 
then they are in a hopeless position. They are lost. That is what this sixth chapter is talking about. It's urging that those that perhaps were not real, that had their doubts, to press on and to grow up, to, to move beyond the elementary principles of the doctrines concerning the Messiah, to recognize what the Old Testament had to say about a suffering Messiah. You know, there's some other parts of this chapter too that present difficulties. And um, verse four, it says, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have taste of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. Well, you say, if they're enlightened, and tasted of the heavenly gift and made partakers of the Holy Ghost. Surely this is talking about saved people. No. And it's not by trick and cunning and devious means that I say that. You know, it says in uh, John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 9, concerning the Lord Jesus, that this was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. You know, if I turn a light on in a room, everyone is illuminated. And when the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world, everyone, as it were, that was in his presence was illuminated by that light. He said he was the light of the world. It didn't mean that everyone that was in his presence was automatically saved. That word there, enlightened, is translated in the 10th chapter, illuminated. So we can be illuminated and then still reject the truth we can still reject the light. And then the word partaker of the Holy Ghost. In what way were they partaker of the Holy Ghost if they weren't saved? Well, I spoke on this also in one of these meetings on the subject of fellowship and the word fellowship. And I won't repeat all that I said in there. You can go back to that meeting because it was recorded if you're interested. But there are two words in Greek that in English, at least, they are frequently, or sometimes at least, translated partaker. But they mean two different things in the original language. So one means to have in common, and the other simply means to share in something. One is an intimate association with, and it's usually translated in English as fellowship or communion. The other one, as I said, just means to share in something, to partake in something with others. And it's here, this word used, partaker, is the weaker one. It's simply to share in. And if you were to turn back in Hebrews to chapter 2, in verse 4, it says, God also bearing the witness both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. So God came in the Lord Jesus Christ, and miracles were performed. And after uh, Pentecost, well, Adam, the day of Pentecost, there was the speaking in tongues, another miracle. The apostles performed miracles. These early believers, uh, uh, these individuals to the, whom the book of the Hebrews is addressed, witnessed these things. They were partakers in them. It could be even referring to one that was saved by miraculous means. You don't have to be a believer, um, not saved, uh, healed, healed by miraculous means. You don't have to be a believer to be healed by miraculous means. So these early, uh, um, these individuals that were associated with these early Christians witnessed the power of the Holy Spirit. They were partakers. They shared in it in that sense. And even with all that, there was still this possibility that they could turn their back on what they had seen and witnessed. You know, that verses one through three, it's often been said they revert to earthly things before Christ ascended. And then verses four through five reverse refer to heavenly things after Christ ascended. When he ascended, he poured out gifts through the power of the Holy Spirit, there were, people witnessed it. Not everyone were believers that witnessed it. 
in fact, the, 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 the manifestation of the Holy Spirit was really for the benefit of unbelievers to convince them. But then 7 through 12 of the sixth chapter refers to fruits. And the seed was sown, just like Matthew 13. The seed was sown. The question was now, would it bring forth fruit? You know, the rain came down, those spiritual blessings. And when the rain comes down, it rains on the just and the unjust alike. Those spiritual blessings had come down. Would that seed germinate? Would there be life? And then the writer, he says, in, in uh, Hebrews 6 and verse 9, he says, Beloved, we are persuaded better things of you, things that accompany salvation, though thus we speak. So here's one of those examples in the book of Hebrews. He's persuaded. He, he, he wants to believe that they're all truly saved but he has some lingering doubts. But nevertheless, he's persuaded better things of them, that indeed that seed would germinate and that would be truly life with them. Anyway, that's a long explanation of Hebrews 6. Um, but it's not speaking of one that has their salvation and loses it. If you just understand it in the context of the book of Hebrews, it is really very clear what that chapter is talking about. Let's go to chapter 10. I need to move a little quicker. Some of you probably already think that I'm moving too quick, but maybe I can just uh, shorten my, my notes on it. So, you know, the, pra the, 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 the uh, doctrinal part of Hebrews ends with chapter 10, verse 18. And then we get more onto the practical side of things. And as I said, there was two huge hurdles for the Jew. One was that the Messiah was crucified. And so the first part of Hebrews really addresses who the Lord Jesus was and how he answered to every um, type and promise of the Old Testament. When we get to the uh, 10th chapter after verse 18. We switch to the practical side of it. And then we start looking at the other question, the other stumbling block for a Jew. They were suffering persecution. Why were they suffering persecution? Um, you know, the Jew, to the Jewish mind, if you walked, if you walked uh, with God, then you received blessing in your life, not suffering. And when Israel did things that were wrong, then they suffered under the judgment of God. But the sufferings that they were experiencing now were not those type of sufferings that they had suffered as a disobedient nation if the world rejected the lord jesus christ then we as believers are going to be rejected as well we are not promised here in this walk um, a walk free of suffering in fact exactly the opposite we are told that we are going to suffer persecution if we walk godly so in fact, their sufferings that they were experiencing were indeed a proof of the reality of what they believed. It was not showing them that they had taken a wrong path, but rather those sufferings that they were experiencing were sh and showed that they had taken a right path. And as I sort of indicated with Hebrews 6, if they had come up with theologically or doctrinally decided, no, the Lord Jesus didn't fit the Messiah promised from the Old Testament, then they were completely without hope. There was no other Messiah that was going to come. Now, when we get to the 10th chapter, if they were to come to the wrong conclusion and say, well, the suffering that we're experiencing is because we've taken a wrong path, we've believed the wrong thing, and if they were going to reject the grace of God, then there was no hope for them. And that's what Hebrews 10 takes up. Uh, if God's grace is rejected, there is no hope for man. If I had a massive debt that I could not pay, and someone came along and said, I will pay it. And I said, no, 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 I, I'm going to do this on my own. I am doomed. I've given up the one opportunity I have had of being set free, and I've refused it. 
to refuse the grace of God is is the end for man. What what more can God do? And to refuse it, man spells his own doom. So I I just will touch on one word in Hebrews 10, and that that it um, that's the word sanctified. I'm going to read verse 29, Hebrews 10, 29. It says, Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. Spoke a little bit about doing despite unto the Spirit of grace, rejecting the grace of God. But what about the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified. It's that bit that causes people to say, well, Hebrews 10 is speaking about believers. And it's speaking about believers giving up what they believe and losing their salvation. And I'm saying it's not. It's talking about these Jews that were struggling, struggling to understand what they were going through, who weren't yet saved that we're in danger of making a wrong, con coming to a wrong conclusion. You know, when Israel, and you can go back to the ninth chapter if you want to, were in the wilderness, they were sprinkled with blood. All of them. And yet we know that there were many amongst them that had no faith. But they were, all came under the sprinkling of the blood of that covenant whether they were saved or unsaved. You know, sanctification can mean three different things. In its literal sense, it means to be make holy. But to make something holy, we set it apart in a clean place. And so sanctification can also mean just that, physically set apart. In John 17, the Lord says he's going to sanctify himself. Did he need to be made holy? Of course not. What's he talking about? He was going to be ascended from this earth to be with the Father. That was a physical sanctification, a setting apart. We are sanctified when we're saved by the blood of... Uh, well, actually, I'm going to read what it says in 1 Peter 1, 2, because I'll get it wrong if I try to quote it. It says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling the blood of Jesus Christ. That's a sanctification that every believer presently possesses. And then there's also the practical sanctification in our own lives. So in our walk, there is a ongoing practical sanctification that God works in our life. But the sanctification that we speak read of here is positional. It is taking an outward position and uh, identifying with that position without necessarily having reality. But you notice that, again, in this chapter, uh, he urges them on not to give up, not to draw back. So verse 36 says, For ye have need of patience. That after you've done the will of God, you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. That is the danger of one that's gone so far, outwardly, accepting Jesus as Messiah, but not taking that step of faith. But then he says, but we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. It's not here about one losing their salvation, but one not pressing on to gain salvation or um, to believe. The, the word gain could be misunderstood, but not one not pressing on to believe unto salvation. Anyway. And that's all I have to say on Hebrews. It's probably the Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10 are probably the two weapons that will be used against you if you ever run into someone that rejects uh, the eternal security of their salvation. But 
you know, doubts is eternal security don't come from the word of God. Yes, these portions in Hebrews 6, Hebrews 10, if not understood rightly, can cause doubts and fears. But put in their context, I think they're plain enough. By the way, Hebrews 11 then goes on and gives all these Old Testament examples of individuals who walked by faith and pressed on, having never seen the promises. You know, these, these Jewish believers, or these uh, here, were concerned because they were suffering persecution. They looked for liberation and not persecution. And so then the writer gives a whole chapter of people in the Old Testament that suffered and never also, they, they never got the promise either. Whereas we we are indeed going to get the promise, just not here and now. But anyway, uh, the most common doubts, uh, or, or another common doubt or in connection with eternal security are those doubts that are raised by our own reasoning just with predestination election all the difficulties stem from our own reasoning and one of those common objections is is that eternal security leaves us free to sin and certainly if we're told well, you know, if you go on in a path of sin, you're going to lose your salvation. That seems, naturally speaking, a tremendous deterrent from not sinning. But unfortunately, it leaves a Christian in absolute bondage. It leaves the Christian in a Romans 7 condition of things. And again, I spoke on that in, a, in an earlier talk. But again, it's a, it just stems back to a complete misunderstanding of what salvation is. Salvation is not about fixing the old nature. Uh, you know, what's interesting is when people say, well, if you believe in eternal security, you're free to sin. The Bible asks that very same question and it answers that question. And it's not something we have to speculate about. So in Romans 6, Paul writes, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? There's that question that the grace of God may abound. And then he proceeds to answer it. And you know what? In his answer, he never once says, because if you continue in sin, you're going to lose your salvation. Because it's simply not possible. No, the answer says, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? If we understand that we have new birth, that we have a completely new nature, that that old man, everything that characteristic characterizes man by nature is seen as crucified with Christ. Then we're not going to continue in sin. We're going to walk in that newness of life, which characterizes that new nature. Again, so many of these thoughts stem from centuries of wrong understanding in connection with salvation. You know, we don't walk as Christians because we're trying to build a relationship with God. You and I, we're not trying to gain a relationship with God. We walk as Christians because we are children of God. You know, your neighbor's child is not pretending to be your child so he can become a member of your family. Your children, on the other hand, there's a behavior expected of them. Whether they're completely disobedient or not, there's a expe behavior expected of them. Why? Because they are your children. There's a behavior expected of us because we are now brought into the family of God. We are children of God. We are sons of God. And so Ephesians 5.1 says, Be ye therefore followers of God. Why? So you might become children? No. Be ye followers of God as dear children. You know it. One, an, an, another objection, and this ties in with the subject of election that might be brought up is from First Peter, uh, Second Peter chapter one. 
in second peter chapter one it says um in verse 10 i'll read it wherefore the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure if you do these things you shall never fall what does it mean to make our election sure well first of all we have to ask in whose eyes are we trying to make our election sure is it in god's sight that we're trying to make our election sure that's ridiculous he's the one that called me he's the one that elected me i don't have to be made sure in his eyes at all he's quite sure of it but am i sure of it am i walking in the good of it you know at the beginning of hebrews i mean uh, second peter sorry second peter chapter one it says there that god has given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness it says he's given us everything we need we're equipped for this wilderness journey and it also says there that um wherefore whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature i spoke on this when i talked about fellowship the, the thought here is not about how we get the divine nature but about walking in fellowship with the divine nature and again we have uh, exceeding and great uh, exceeding great and precious promises in connection with that Going back to what I said before, the gospel is not a promise. You either have it, you're either saved or you're not saved. You're not waiting to get to heaven to find out whether you have the promise of salvation or not. Salvation is not a promise. The things that have been spoken of in this first chapter are connected with our walk. Are you and I going to make our election sure to us by our walk you know the picture of a sailing vessel entering a port is often used in connection with this and you know you can uh, we could sail into harbor at the end of our journey with our sails intact ship our yacht nice and clean or at the end of our lives, we can sail into that harbor with our sails completely in tatters and our ship look like it's weathered the worst storm that a ship could ever weather. What is our entrance into that harbor going to look like? A shipwreck or not? I had a few more thoughts and I'll just briefly touch on them. So is there no consequence for sin? Do we just, yes, sure, we should live according to that good of that new nature that we possess. We should make our calling and election sure so that we don't make our lives a shipwreck. But let's say we do. Are there no consequences? Why not? I, I might as well just live whatever way I like if there's no consequences. Yes, there are consequences but they aren't connected with salvation. Because we are children of God, God is not going to let us just go and do our own will. And so it says in uh, Hebrews 12, I'm just gonna read it from my notes, Hebrews 12 verses five and six. Ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. So God doesn't just let us go on and walk independently in our own wills. He will allow things in our life. There's also something else scripture speaks of, and that is uh, the judgment seat of Christ. We all, sinner and saint alike, are going to have to appear before the Lord Jesus Christ. But we as believers can confidently say that it's not to decide whether we're gonna be condemned or not. We can say, as it says in Romans eight, there is therefore now no condemnation of those in Christ Jesus. We can say what it says in John five, verse 24, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth my word, 
heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. So if we as believers have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and it's not as a question of condemnation, it's not a question of salvation, then why do we have to appear there? Well, it tells us. It's in uh, that portion, by the way, 2 Corinthians 5. It says so that, uh, I'll have to look up the verse. I have it in my notes somewhere, but I'm not seeing it. Just 2 Corinthians 5. And verse 10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So yes, those things that we have done that are bad, we're going to know about them. And that's going to have to, and, and those things are going to be taken care of. And we're going to be thankful that they are. But there are also rewards. There are also rewards to be given. Those rewards aren't what motivate us now. It says later in this chapter, the love of Christ constrains us. But nevertheless, particularly for those suffering persecution, uh, rewards are offered as an encouragement. But again, what does the writer say in this chapter concerning the judgment seat of Christ? Does he say, I'm telling you this, so you don't go on sinning because you might lose your salvation? No, no mention of it, no hint of it. No, he says, I'm telling you, he says of concerning himself, he says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. In other words, his takeaway from knowing that he was going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ was to go out and evangelize, to reach men, to reach those that were lost, he wasn't concerned for his salvation. He was concerned for those that were lost. So the Lord does care how we walk in our life, but he just never hangs over our head. The thought of losing our salvation, it's completely nonsensical. We cannot be unborn again. But more than that, the Lord Jesus Christ is both our high priest and advocate. And as our high priest, he intercedes for us. And he, uh, it says in, um, it says in Hebrews 7, verse 25, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come to God by him, seeing he liveth to make intercession for them. He ever liveth to make intercession for them. So the daily preservation of the believer is in the hands of the one who gave himself for us. And it says, save them to the uttermost. Just how most, how uttermost is uttermost? It doesn't say he saves them almost. Lord Jesus is also our advocate. His high priestly work is to prevent us from falling into sin. His advocacy is if we do fall into sin. He restores us when we do. He doesn't throw us off. So what we do as parents with our children when they disobey us, just throw them off. We're done with you. That's it. No. Parents are imperfect. And maybe you can find stories of cases where families have done that. But no, God restores us. That's what his advocacy does. And so 1 John 2, verse 1 says, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteousness, the righteous. You know, when Peter was there denying the Lord, swearing with oaths, the Lord just turned and looked at him. And Peter went away and wept. That's the advocacy of Christ. That's how his advocacy works. He doesn't, that word advocate's a different one. Sometimes the thought of a lawyer comes up. Well, a lawyer you hire to go to get you out of trouble. The advocacy of Christ is not about getting us out of trouble, but bringing us to repentance, self-judgment. Anyway, that's that sums up my talk. I know I covered a lot, but again, uh, this is recorded. I'm willing to send my notes to Robert and he can distribute them as uh, to anyone that wants them. These are important subjects of uh, the Satan. Satan can use these subjects to destroy your Christian walk in many ways. Might tell you, well, it doesn't matter how you walk. You're elect. You're, you can't lose your salvation. Go eat, drink, and be merry. 
It's a pathway that just leads to sorrow, suffering. You may always just hold that over your head. Well, you, you just, if you, you don't know whether you're really saved or not, maybe that last thing that you did, you lost your salvation then, and now you need to gain it back. That's an unfruitful Christian life. You're not going to be bearing fruit for the Lord if that's, that's where you're at. Anyway, we've got a little time for questions.